Okay, so that brings us to the second talk this afternoon. It will be given by Professor Lancy Yip of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And she's leading a team with individuals from the University of Hong Kong, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, as well as City University of Hong Kong. And she will tell us about stem cell strategy for nervous system disorders. Please, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thanks for giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, some of the highlights of our TRS project uh, entitled Stem Cell Strategy for Nervous System Disorders. Well, I'm sure you agree with me that um, the human brain is the most uh, amazing organ in our body. Uh, it has uh, 100 billion neurons with 100 trillion uh, connections. The prevailing belief for a long time has been that uh, the brain remains uh, structurally constant through our life. The brain cells, uh, the brain cannot form new neurons, and the recovery from traumatic injuries such as a stroke or spinal cord injury is impossible because supposedly no new neurons can be formed. So brain disorders uh, represent a, uh, a major health threat uh, for us today, uh, including neurodevelopmental disorders, neurodegenerative diseases. Since the understanding of brain disorders uh, is still very limited, there is currently no cure nor effective treatments. The prevalence of brain disorders in an aging population is increasing substantially. It has been estimated that by 2050, um, the number of uh, elderly, that is those about 60 years old, will constitute more than 20% of the total population. And since uh, brain disorders uh, affect uh, mainly the elderly, uh, it has been estimated that about 2 billion people uh, will be affected globally. And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, brain disorders uh, Currently, there are very few effective treatments, so the economic impact uh, is huge, estimated to be about two trillion U.S. dollars per year. Now, it is an urgent task for us to uh, come up with therapeutic treatments for brain disorders, and therefore, uh, it is now considered to be the top priority for many countries worldwide. One major hurdle in treating uh, neurological diseases or in coming up with novel therapeutic treatments for these diseases is that we cannot use uh, human brain tissues to study or to do drug testing. With the recent discoveries from the last decade, uh, there seems to be hope uh, along this uh, path. So it has been uh, reported that actually the human brain is capable of generating new neurons over one's entire lifetime. And secondly, um, there is the discovery of uh, stem cells which are self-renewal and multipotent. Now these stem cells can serve as very valuable uh, research tools for us to model the human neurological diseases and also for use as drug screening and there's a huge potential uh, for therapeutic development. Now with the observations that um, the new uh, uh, neural stem cells, uh, when generated, they will form neurons and then they will migrate to the specific site to be integrated. With these ob observations in mind, there can be two approaches for us to harness this regenerative capacity that has been reported. The first one, is to transplant the neural stem cells or neurons into our brain. And the second approach is to activate endogenous neural stem cells or neurons. Now, however, the brain circuit is highly accurate and robust. And therefore, before we can implement any of these uh, approaches, there is much for us to learn about neurogenesis. And the challenges faced include the following. The first, the stem cells, they have to differentiate into appropriate neural cells, and they have to migrate to the appropriate site of damage in the host brain. And they also have to integrate accurately with adjacent cells and exhibit the correct functionality. 
So these are some of the challenges that we must overcome before we can consider implementing uh, any of those strategies. It is therefore essential for us to elucidate the regulatory pathways underlying neurogenesis and differentiation of stem cells. With this rationale in mind, we therefore uh, uh, started this project uh, on stem cell strategy for nervous system disorders. What we aim to do is to elucidate key signaling pathways that are associated with neurodevelopment and neurological disorders. And we use, we use two models, model systems. One is neural stem cell platform, and the other is mouse model. And by understanding the uh, pathways that underlie the neurodevelopmental process and neurological disorders, we aim to identify molecular targets which would review um, the pathological mechanisms and that would allow us to pursue uh, drug development efforts. So in a nutshell, our program actually uh, encompasses both basic research and drug discovery. So through basic research, we would like to elucidate the molecular and cellular mechanisms that control the processes of amplification, differentiation, maturation, and integration of neurons into the circuit. And we establish different uh, model systems or platforms in order for us to, uh, to perform drug screening following the identification of molecular target. So we aim to translate the knowledge from basic research into technological and therapeutic uh, applications. To conduct this particular project, we have amalgamated expertise from various institutions with the participation of about 19 colleagues with expertise in the areas of uh, molecular and systems neuroscience, structural biology, uh, stem cell and neurodevelopmental biology, neuroengineering, chemical biology, and drug discovery. And four uh, institutions engaged in this very important TRS project. Now, during neurodevelopment, uh, the process of neurogenesis occur throughout life. And um, for both embryonic neurogenesis and adult neurogenesis, actually, similar patterns um, of these processes are involved. And these involve, uh, include proliferation, differentiation, migration, and integration. And I, I like to highlight that every single process is actually controlled um, with a very precise uh, signaling pathways involved. If there are any dysfunctions in these signaling pathways, it will lead to dysregulation of neurogenesis, resulting in psychiatric disorders, mood disorders, learning and memory deficits. So alteration of embryonic neurogenesis can lead to various neurodevelopmental disorders. It can result in a smaller brain, so-called microcephaly, or bigger brain, so-called macrocephaly. And it's also uh, demonstrated that uh, it is associated with autism, which uh, have the phenotypes of impaired social interaction, repetitive or stereotype uh, behaviors, verbal and nonverbal uh, communication deficits. So it is very critical for the team to identify the molecular signals that control neurogenesis and also the brain size. Now this shows that during development, there is robust neurogenesis resulting in an increased uh, brain size over the nine month period. So what I show here is that um, initially you have the, uh, the stem cell divide resulting in a stem cell and a daughter cell. And this, uh, the neuron will then migrate to the uh, appropriate destination. And once the neurons reach the des destination, it will form connections, the so-called synaptic connections with the appropriate target cells. 
to ensure proper uh, neurogenesis, uh, different cellular processes have to be tightly controlled. So it is important for, uh, for us to understand how these processes are controlled. How are they being controlled in a precise manner via these uh, signaling network? So we aim to understand neurostem cell proliferation, maintenance, differentiation, and we also aim to determine how they integrate into the existing neural circuitry in order to ensure the, the survival of newborn neurons. And finally, our aim is to understand the mechanisms of neurodevelopmental disorders. What are the molecular signals that have gone wrong? And, and what happened with these signaling pathways that ultimately result in a particular neurodevelopmental disorder? We use advanced technologies to allow us to manipulate the expression level of specific proteins that we believe will regulate neurogenesis. And we use different uh, types of uh, methodology to allow us to visualize these neurons uh, in the brain, for example, using GFP, that would allow us to uh, uh, correctly visualize uh, these neurons. So team members have identified uh, a number of very interesting molecular targets or pathways that they demonstrate to regulate uh, embryonic neurogenesis as listed here. And the subsequent work show that some of, the, uh, uh, of these target proteins, their mutations are associated with brain disorders such as schizophrenia and microcephaly. And they have dissected their roles in neurogenesis and their findings provide very important insight to the pathology of these disorders. I would just want to highlight one example to illustrate these efforts. And it concerns the scaffold protein called axon. So we show that axon is a very key molecule in regulating the expansion of the brain cortex. And axon achieves that by regulating the processes of uh, amplification. And we have delineated the detailed molecular processes whereby axon can bring about uh, this uh, amplification. And our subsequent work show that axon can, only, can also uh, regulate the process of neuronal differentiation. So ultimately, axon can increase the number of neurons produced. Now, if we inject a small molecule called XAV939, uh, it is a molecule that can stabilize the axon protein. And by doing so, it increases the level of axon. What we found is that injection of this small molecule, XAV939, we can see an increase in the number of neural stem cells. So these uh, New, newborn cells, uh, we can label them at uh, E15 and analyze them at E18. We also found that the injection of XAV939 resulting in a high level of axon can, uh, can lead to enlarged mouse brain. So I show the data here that um, the brain of XAV injected mouse is much larger than the control brain and this analysis was done at postnatal day nine, uh, 60. And when we measure the, the brain size uh, and also the brain weight, we can see a significant increase over control. So this shows that XAV939 uh, injection can result in a significant increase in brain size and brain weight. Now what happened to the behavioral phenotype? So again, we uh, injected XAV and we compare uninjected control with XAV939 injected mouse. You can see the difference very clearly. In the XAV939 uh, uh, injected mouse, they, um, they exhibit the typical um, autism-like behavior, uh, which also includes compulsive and rep repetitive uh, behaviors. And we use different um, uh, tests in order for us to draw uh, uh, 
uh, that kind of conclusions. So what we have shown, therefore, is that if we inject XAV939, we increase the level of axon, you have increased level of neurogenesis, it will result in autistic behavior in the mice. So we believe our findings uh, has a lot of significance. First, we have now successfully generated a mouse model with excessive excitatory neurons in a neural uh, in a new, new cortex for autism studies. We have also identified axon-associated pathways as drug targets uh, for neurological dis, uh, disorders. And so with that kind of uh, findings, we believe that we have a good handle on identifying the critical players that regulate uh, embryonic neurogenesis and adult neurogenesis. And these two processes actually uh, share uh, very similar signaling pathways. In addition to understanding what are the signaling processes that can regulate neurogenesis intrinsically, we are also interested in understanding how external factors, how external manipulations can regulate the process of neurogenesis. So we set up a model whereby we look at the uh, influence of running on uh, neurogenesis. So, as you can see in this particular diagram, uh, the red dots uh, indicate the newborn neurons, uh, the, the, uh, new, uh, the neural stem cells, and then the, uh, the green color cells, they represent immature neurons. So with uh, running, you can see that there is a substantial increase of these uh, cells compared to uh, without running. So it shows that uh, these physical exercise can actually increase the generation of neurons in the brain. There are, of course, other factors that can enhance, for example, social, cognitive, and motor uh, stimulations. And it has been reported that these manipulations can increase the generation of neurons in the brain as well. Now, when the process of neurogenesis is dysregulated, it can result in pathological uh, phenotype. An example I put here, put down here, is uh, depression. So it has been reported that the stress can increase uh, the level of neurogenesis in the adult hippocampus. And uh, exercise can uh, actually exert the opposite effect. So adult neurogenesis is critical for the therapeutic effects of uh, antidepressants. And this particular disorder is very important because it affects about 70% of the world's population. Now we further uh, study how XAV939 can affect neurogenesis in the adult mouse. So here, what, what you see is that uh, if we deliver uh, XAV939 using osmotic pump, and then we analyze the number of uh, uh, new uh, neural stem cells, you can clearly see that XAV can enhance the, uh, the number of uh, neural stem cells as shown in this uh, quantitation here. Now when we look at the behavior uh, uh, phenotype, we use different models uh, for the adult mice. So we use very standardized uh, tests such as uh, novelty suppressed fe feeding or the force wing test. So these kind of tests can allow us to assess whether XAV939 can alleviate the uh, depression-related uh, behavior. So without going through the details, I just want to um, emphasize that if we measure the latency time for the mouse to, um, to uh, get to the uh, food palate, it will measure the uh, extent of the depression-related behavior. And we found that XAV939 can reduce the latency in both the um, novelty suppressed feeding test and also in the force swim test. So 
We are convinced that XAV939 is a very promising small molecule um, that can regulate neurogenesis and therefore is a, is a promising uh, candidate for uh, neuronal disorders such as depression. Now, of course, we would like to identify more positive hits. So we have set up the primary uh, uh, culture pref platform in order for us to, uh, to do the drug screening. And uh, these are what the cells look like um, with our cell uh, platform, neural stem cell platform. And we can perform analysis and a quantitation uh, protocol uh, with ease. And we can then therefore identify small molecules that can increase neural stem cell proliferation or enhance the process of neural uh, differentiation. We can also uh, use the high throughput cellular imaging and data analysis in order for us to evaluate if the small molecules can amplify uh, the neural stem cells or the neuronal precursor cells. So this is just one example of the screening efforts that we have done. And so this compound, 47X7, uh, exhibit the ability to, uh, to uh, increase the proliferation of adult uh, neural progenitor cells. Now, we also assess the functional outcome and using a battery of behavioral tests because we know that if we uh, regulate new, uh, adult neurogenesis, it can also impact on the affective state and also the memory. And the number of behavioral uh, tests that we have uh, established over the years allow us to um, evaluate if the small molecule can um, can have a bene beneficial effect uh, in all these experimental paradigms. So, so far I have uh, shown you our efforts, uh, or rather highlights of our efforts, in doing basic research in identifying key molecules that can regulate neurogenesis. And with that knowledge, we can perform drug screening using the cell platform that we have set up. And these screening can be, for example, target-based uh, screening or phenotypic screening. And with that uh, finding, we can move on to do translational research and see which of the positive hits that we have identified can actually be further pursued for drug development. Now, I have uh, shared with you earlier that after the uh, newborn neurons migrate to the target site, it has to form connection with the right targets. And this is important to ensure proper brain functions. So the brain cells communicate a very specialized compartment called the synapse. And they communicate uh, with each, each other at this uh, very specialized compartment, mediating the information flow from one brain cell to another. And the modulation of synaptic strength is believed to be the molecular and cellular basis of learning and memory. Synaptic loss or dysfunction can lead to various brain disorders, uh, such as uh, Alzheimer's disease. And as you're all very familiar with this disease, it's associated with memory loss, faulty reasoning, and uh, also impaired locomotion uh, ability. And the hallmarks of, of this particular disease includes amyloid plaques and also neurofibrillary tangles. Now, for, for uh, those aged over 80 or 85, about 50% of these individuals uh, are likely to um, have this particular disease. So therefore, part of our efforts is to identify the molecular targets that can mediate the synaptic impairment in uh, Alzheimer's disease. And we were able to identify one cellular uh, target, the so-called EPHA4 or FA4. We found that when this particular target is abnormally activated, it can suppress neuronal communication, and it can also impair learning and memory. And this cell surface target can be abnormally activated by amyloid beta, which is believed to be a, um, a, a synaptotoxic agent for Alzheimer's disease. So with this finding, we were therefore interested 
to uh, identify small molecules that can regulate the activity uh, of this cell surface receptor. So in collaboration uh, with uh, team members, we undertook a molecular docking based uh, virtual screening and uh, identify small molecules that have the ability to inhibit uh, this receptor FA4. We then went on to elucidate the mechanism of actions and ev uh, evaluate the efficacy in animal models, um, for example, looking at the uh, memory performance. So one of the small molecules that we have identified uh, is called rinkofilin. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we identify it using the molecular docking approach. Uh, and the, this, the source that we have screened is a traditional Chinese medicine library. We found that this small molecule actually acts in complex with the ligand binding domain of the receptor that I mentioned earlier, uh, FA4. We perform a behavioral tests to try and understand if this small molecule, when administered to the mouse, can exhibit a beneficial effect in terms of um, uh, learning and memory. And so this is um, 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 the so-called morris water maze test that I think many of you in the audience are quite familiar with. So there's a hidden platform here, and the mouse is uh, trained to identify the location of the hidden platform, and then after the, the mouse is trained, we remove the hidden platform and trace the, the swimming path of the mouse. And we found that actually, if the mouse has good memory, it would spend most of the time swimming in this quadrant that used to have the hidden platform. So we, um, we quantitate uh, the, uh, the percent time of the mouse spent uh, swimming in this particular quadrant. So for a wild type normal mouse, um, it was spent more than 30% time in that quadrant because the mouse remember that's where the hidden platform is. Now with the Alzheimer's disease mouse model, uh, APPPS1 mouse, the memory is impaired and so the mouse will spend only about 20% time in that particular quadrant. After the mouse was orally administered with uh, the small molecule rinkofilin, we found that there's an increase in the percent time uh, of the mouse spent uh, swimming in the quadrant. So this is an indication that indeed a rinkofilin administration to the mouse can uh, improve the learning and memory performance. We also look at the impact of rinkofilin on some um, uh, hallmark, pathological hallmark of the uh, APPPS1 mice, such as the uh, amyloid uh, plaque deposition. And we found that indeed, with rinkofilin administration, um, there is reduction uh, of the amyloid plaque uh, deposits in the brain. So all these findings are very, very encouraging because rinkofilin uh, can improve the communication between brain cells, and it can also uh, enhance uh, the uh, uh, learning and memory process. So we know that synaptic loss, neuronal loss, it can lead to brain dysfunctions. Damage to uh, the neurons or loss of neurons can result in dysfunctions uh, that are uh, associated with brain disorders. So we believe that if we can replace or uh, uh, replace the lost neurons or the damaged neurons, we will be in a good position to help uh, with the recovery process. So promoting uh, neuronal regeneration through advanced biotechnology or through the kind of manipulations that I share with you uh, today, we think that these are potential uh, therapeutic interventions that we can pursue in order to allow us to repair or replace uh, these damaged uh, uh, brain tissues. We have identified compounds in our uh, program that can enhance neurogenesis. We, we have identified compounds that are very specific against molecular targets, whether it is um, it has to do with uh, amplification or differentiation of neurons or uh, helping the neurons to form uh, synaptic connections with the right target cells. 
So moving forward, uh, we would like to uh, use the human-induced uh, prepotent stem cells, human iPSCs, to study neurological diseases. As I mentioned earlier, the complexity of our brain and also the inability to use human brain tissues um, to, for research represent one major hurdle uh, in treating neurological diseases. So to us, human iPSCs provide an unlimited source of human cells for our studies. We have established uh, uh, cell lines uh, directly from patients and we have differentiated them into uh, different uh, unique brain cell types. And, it, and therefore, in so doing, we are actually establishing models of neurological diseases in a dish. So these are the manipulations that we can do with these human iPSC cells. For example, we can use CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, gene editing technology to um, to uh, prepare these various uh, isogenic iPSCs and also differentiate them into different cell types such as neurons, um, astrocytes, microglia, microglia, etc. So again, moving forward, one of our goals is to characterize the risk factors associated with Alzheimer's disease. We have conducted um, a, a genome-wide uh, association study focusing on Chinese Alzheimer's disease patients. And with these genetic variants that we have identified, we can then use the human iPSC uh, uh, platform in order to allow us to uh, look at the consequences uh, of these mutations, which uh, are associated with a high risk of getting the disease. And we will be able to understand the, the pathways, the molecular mechanisms that underlie the disease. And that will also allow us to perform drug screening using the human iPSCs platforms. So for this uh, TRS project, we have laid the foundation for uh, the development of neural stem cell based regeneration treatments, uh, regenerative treatments for neurological disorders. Through basic research, we have identified and characterized key signaling pathways that regulate the proliferation, differentiation uh, of neuroprogenitor cells. We have identified those pathways that are key for regulating the integration of these uh, newborn neurons into the neuronal circuit. We have also conducted translational research using both cell-based models and animal models in order to look at the therapeutic potential of modulating the uh, selected signaling pathways and identify small molecules that possess neurogenic activities. And we have published a number of uh, uh, papers in esteemed journals, uh, a number of patents, uh, and also train a large number of students through this TRS project, foster interdisciplinary and inter-institutional collaborations, and, and enhance stem cell research in Hong Kong. So in terms of impact, we believe that um, uh, our program uh, is addressing a very important area of biomedical research. We use new approaches, advanced technology to achieve our goals. And um, we also provided local training opportunities and enhanced uh, Hong Kong's leading position uh, in uh, neuroscience and also neuro stem cell research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lee. Please remain on stage. We will now invite Professor Chen again to come forward to host the Q&A section with Professor Yi, please. Maybe I can invite my team members to come too. Can you just come in case they have questions that you can help to ask? Well, so thank you, Professor Yip, for giving us a very comprehensive account of the achievement of your project. Uh, so the talk's now open to the floor. Thank you very much, Anzi, uh, for a very uh, comprehensive overview of uh, the achievement uh, in, in this uh, study. Um, I'm particularly intrigued by your compound XAV939, um, where you actually demonstrate it increased neurogenesis, and then the brain gets larger. Did you actually analyze what type of neurons does this compound um, work on? 
or when it increased neurogenesis. Uh, these glutamatergic neurons or GABAergic neurons uh, that got specially sort of uh, stimulated? Is there right. any data? Right. So I, I believe our analysis was um, on glutamatergic uh, neurons. Okay. Uh, XAV can actually uh, shift the balance between excitatory and inhibitory uh, uh, neurons. Right. Is that effect due to axin? Meaning, would axin? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So because XAV, the, the main uh, mechanism is really to uh, stabilize axin. Uh, it's a tanquinase inhibitor, so it can stabilize axin because it it uh, prevent the de degradation. So when you have enhanced level of axon, axon can exhibit the effect both in the cytosol and also in the nucleus. But what I mean is then the neurogenesis that gets stimulated is only confined to glutamatergic phenotype. Uh, well, axin. I think... Huh? Axin. Yeah. Is so it only... I don't know if... Generate the glutamatergic phenotype? I think it's mainly due to the uh, experimental paradigm we do because actually we inject the uh, uh, small molecule into the um, um, embryonic cerebral cortex at uh, the embryonic stage where at which the, um, the time is for the generation of the excitative neurons. So it's mainly the approach that we use. So uh, with the increase of excitative neurons and then we show that it will cause the imbalance of the excitatory and inhibitory in the cerebral cortex. Right. Then you have another small molecule which is quite interesting, 4787. Does yes. it have similar uh, uh, effect as it's a it's a different uh, it's a different type of small molecule. So for yeah, that understand. particular one, we actually have not uh, looked at the detailed mechanism yet. So for that one, we did a, a general screen. So it was not a target screen. It's a phenotypic screen. So okay. we we set up the the neural stem cell platform, and then we uh, did the phenotypic screening. And that particular uh, compound turned out to. Uh, increase the proliferation of the uh, progenitor cells. So we have not looked at the detail mechanism. For, for XAV939 is a, is a target-based uh, mechanism. We know that it acts on axon. But for the compound 4737 is a phenotypic screen, so. All right, yep. okay, thank you. So maybe I'll follow, follow up with this question. Now for the molecule EPX4A, a4. A4. You mentioned that it is orally administered and then it affects neural communication. So neural communication, right? So the small molecule is called rinkofilin and it right. acts on the receptor called EPHA4. So rinkofilin okay. is orally administered. Okay, so it crosses the rubbing barrier? We, does it, we does it believe the barrier? it does because uh, we did some um, analysis. Uh, looking at the level in the brain, and we were able to uh, to detect it. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's but not it's metabolized. a very low level. It's mm -hmm. not metabolized. It can be metabolized. So when we uh, look at the level in the brain, uh, the exact uh, rinkofilin level is not very high, and we believe that uh, it could be. To metabolize yeah. that is. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But maybe it's enough to uh, to. Uh, elicit the effect even at low level. All right. Thank you. So, uh, Nancy, uh, thank yes. you for your inspiring talk. So, um, from your experiments, it seems that if, we, if there is decreased the neurogenesis, it's bad for, for, for behavior. But the increase No, in no, no, no. Increase is bad too. Increase, like so, so, so in, increase is also bad. Yes. So, do you think the, uh, the brain is so well optimized now so that we cannot do anything to improve. So is there any way in your experiment to improve the yes. behavior? So probably putting less time in, opt or in finding the best way. So can, is there any evidence that uh, any treatment can make us smarter than now? If, if, uh, if you run, it can make you better. <laughs> no, it, it really, I mean, physical exercise can definitely uh, stimulate neurogenesis. That has been demonstrated. 
So what I, uh, the point I try to make is that uh, it, it, it's, it's very well, it's precisely controlled, right? So if it is too much, it is bad. If it is too little, it is bad. So it has to be balanced. But there are ways that you can stimulate uh, neurogenesis in order to have, you know, uh, more newborn neurons, uh, etc. So it has been shown that physical exercise is good for you. Cognitive, you know, stimulation is good for you. So all those can be done. Those are the so-called environmental factors, external factors that, you know, you can you can control. You can of, we we are of course also trying very hard to develop drugs that that would be uh, also another way that we can, um, you know, regulate. Question there. Um, yeah, I, I'm intrigued, uh, you know, about your lecture also. But I, I, I'm, you know, almost 50%, 50 you know, I have Alzheimer's now. So you said, you know, running or exercising would uh, do something of that, and what is the mechanism? Or do you, can you also use that as a testing for your drug? What's the question I, I exercise? I think the question is, what is the mechanism of running, mechanism. enhancing the neurogenesis, right? Yeah. You state your question. Yeah, I think that's the question. It is, I mean, it has been reported, really, if uh, you exercise, uh, it can stimulate neurogenesis, you will have more newborn neurons, because in the adult stage, the part of the uh, brain region that has uh, the capacity to generate new neurons is the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. So it is possible, right, to, to have newborn neurons continuously throughout life. Uh, it, it's not just, you know, during devel development, <laughs> not just over, but throughout life you can have newborn neurons. So it, it really doesn't matter, you know, what age it is. It, the capacity <laughs> is there. I mean, so we would like to harness that regenerative, you know, power throughout life. So that wise Joseph is keep on running. So there's a question in the back. Um, just to follow up the uh, same discussion of Nancy, I'm, as an orthopedic surgeon, I'm very much for the physical exercise. <laughs> and of course, the biophysical stimulation, because we're, and, and lots of uh, work are done on the osteocytes, which have all these extensive dendrites. So molecular biology, chemical, biochemical approach, but there is another big view is around the biophysical stimulation. So exercise is one of them, from vibration to many other things. When we exercise, we're not just the stretching. There's actually so many. So I wonder whether you know, this excellent group will actually uh, engage in some of the studies related to biophysical stimulation without any molecule or chemical intervention. How would that affect the neuroscience and all the neuronal regeneration development? So, so we have been uh, looking into, I mean, of course, uh, in, the, in the muscle as well. Uh, so what we're uh, interested in is to try to understand how the, the skeletal muscle is affecting the brain function. So, so to that end, we're, I mean, of course, doing exercise uh, on the mouse, you know, trying to look at the, the, the kind of uh, myokine secretion, uh, how does it affect the, the neurological functions. We may take one last question from the audience. Uh, I have a question about uh, your small molecule compound XAV939. So because it is a very potent inhibitor of uh, the canonical wind signaling. So I'm just wondering whether administration of this small compound would affect uh, other tissues and organs in the mouth. So, um, so our, our study show that actually the, uh, the, the pathway is through a non canonical signaling path, wind signaling pathway. And also for our study, uh, for the embryonic neurogenesis manipulation, we inject it directly into the brain. For the adult one, we, in, uh, Amy, you want? I think uh, for the data we show, indeed, uh, um, we did not see gross um, health problem in the uh, uh, embryonic mouse brain uh, mouse study after the XAV 99 injection. Actually, the mice can grow up until um, 
day 60, we cannot see the, any defect in the other organs. But as Professor said, actually we do the uh, uh, brain injection. So, uh, so we did not see obvious uh, effect on the, uh, on, um, on the brain, on the other organs, because we directly inject into the uh, mouse brain. So for that part, we mainly affect the, uh, the neuron generation at that period. So for the adult, we use osmotic pump, right, directly into the brain. So, um, so it has to do with the administration route. Thank you, Professor Chen, Professor Yip, and her team for your insightful sharing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our presentation section. Please join me in expressing our appreciation for our facilitators, speakers, and honorable guests of today's symposium. Now, please proceed to the foyer area for the lights refreshments and learn more about the groundbreaking discoveries of each project from the poster and demonstration of their work. Thank you all for coming. Goodbye.